National Public Radio, in association with independent radio drama productions, presents one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes, with Edward Petherbridge as Sherlock Holmes and David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. This is Episode 2 of The Greek Interpreter. Last time, Dr. Watson mused about the private life of Sherlock Holmes. During my long and intimate acquaintance with Sherlock Holmes, I had never heard him refer to his relations, and hardly ever to his early life. This reticence had increased the somewhat inhuman effect which he produced upon me, until I found myself regarding him as an isolated phenomenon, a brain without a heart, as deficient in human sympathy as he was preeminent in intelligence. I had even come to believe he was an orphan with no relatives living. But one day, to my very great surprise, he began to talk to me about his brother. Here's Holmes himself dropping that little bombshell. My ancestors were country squires who appear to have led much the same life as is natural to that class. But I know that my talent, my art, if you like, is in the blood. It may have come from my grandmother, who was the sister of Vernet, the French artist. Such art is liable to take the strangest forms. But how do you know that it is hereditary? Because my brother, Mycroft, possesses it in a larger degree than I do. Watson refuses to accept that Mycroft Holmes might possess powers of reasoning greater than those of Sherlock Holmes. But Holmes is quite rational about it. I cannot agree with those who rank modesty among the virtues. To the logician, all things should be seen exactly as they are. And to underestimate one's powers is as much a departure from truth as to exaggerate them. When I say, therefore, that Mycroft has better powers of observation than I, you may take it. But I'm speaking the exact and literal truth. Oh. Is he your junior? Uh, seven years my senior. How comes it that he is unknown? Oh, he's not unknown. He's very well known. <laughs> in his own circle. Ah, oh, where then? Well, in the Diogenes Club, for example. Diogenes Club? Yes. It is uh, the queerest club in London. And Mycroft, one of the queerest men, is always there from quarter to five to... Twenty-two eight. It's six now, so if you care for a stroll this beautiful evening, I shall be very happy to introduce you to uh, two curiosities. As they walk to the Diogenes Club, Holmes tells Watson why he considers Mycroft his superior. The art of the detective began and ended in reasoning from an armchair. My brother would be the greatest criminal agent that ever lived. Oh, but he has no ambition and no energy. He would not even go out of his way to verify his own solutions and would rather be considered wrong than take the trouble to prove himself right. Again and again I have taken a problem to him and have received an explanation which has afterwards proved to be the correct one. And yet, he was absolutely incapable of working out the practical points which must be gone into before a case could be laid before a judge or a jury. Sherlock Holmes also tells Dr. Watson a bit about the Diogenes Club. There are many men in London, you know, who, some from China, some from misanthropy have no wish for the company of their fellows. Yet they are not averse to comfortable chairs in the latest periodical. <laughs> it is for the convenience of these that the Diogenes Club was started. And it now contains the most unsociable and unclubbable men in town. No member is permitted to take the least notice of any other one. Save in the stranger's room, no talking is under any circumstances permitted, and three offences against this rule, if brought to the notice of the committee, render the talker liable to expulsion. <laughs> My brother was one of the founders. And I have myself found it a very soothing atmosphere. Then comes the moment when Dr. Watson meets the brother of Sherlock Holmes. Mycroft Holmes was a much larger and stouter man than Sherlock. His body was absolutely corpulent. But his face, though massive, had preserved something of the sharpness of expression which was so remarkable in that of his brother. It turns out that a neighbor of Mycroft's named Mr. Malos has had a most curious, remarkable, and dangerous experience. When Sherlock agrees to look into the matter, Mycroft asks Mr. Malos to come over from his lodgings across the street to tell his story. Mr. Malos begins by explaining his profession as translator. This is Wednesday evening. Well, it was on Monday night, only two days ago, you understand, that all this happened. I am an interpreter, as perhaps my neighbor there has told you. I interpret all languages, or nearly all, but as I am a Greek by birth, 
and with a Grecian name, it is with that particular tongue that I am particularly associated. It happens not infrequently that I am sent for at strange hours by foreigners who get into difficulties. So Mr. Melos was not surprised when a stranger showed up asking for his services. The man named Mr. Latimer said he had a Greek friend who had business to conduct, but since the friend only spoke Greek, there was need for a translator. Everything seemed fine when Mr. Melos entered a private cab with Mr. Latimer, but then strange things began to happen. Mr. Melos had been led to believe that his destination was in one part of London, but when he observed that they were headed in a different direction, Mr. Latimer took out a small but deadly club and pulled down the window shades. Mr. Melos was told that it would be inconvenient if he knew where he was going. They traveled for perhaps two hours when they pulled up to a house. Mr. Melos was hustled indoors by Mr. Latimer's associate. He was then introduced to the man whose words he was to translate. As he came into the circle of dim light, I was thrilled with horror at his appearance. He was deadly pale and terribly emaciated with the protruding, brilliant eyes of a man whose spirit is greater than his strength. At first, Mr. Melos did as he was asked and put a series of questions to the tormented man. When he realized that neither Mr. Latimer nor his associate knew a word of Greek, Mr. Melos decided to play a dangerous game. He began to add little questions of his own to the ones he is instructed to put to the man. In this manner, Mr. Melos learns that the victim's name is Cratides, that he comes from Athens, has been in England for three months, and that Mr. Latimer and his associate have been starving him. We went on in this way, and I managed to glean that his name is Gratidis. He is from Athens, that he had no idea where he was, and that his captors were starving him. Another five minutes, Mr. Holmes, and I should have wormed out the whole story under their very noses. But at that instant, a door opened, and a woman stepped into the room. I could not see her clearly enough, but she was tall and graceful, with, I think, black hair, and clad in some sort of loose white gown. That's where the story lies as we begin episode two of The Greek Interpreter. We'll get underway with a brief reprise of highlights from episode one. Edward Petherbridge is Sherlock Holmes. Brother, my dear Holmes, I had no idea. I'm astonished. Is there another man with such singular powers which you say are superior to yours? Uh, the queerest club in London, and my clock, one of the queerest men. He's always there from quarter to five to twenty-two eight. It's six now, so if you care for a stroll this beautiful evening, I shall be very happy to introduce you to uh, two curiosities. Mycroft Holmes was a much larger and stouter man than Sherlock. His body was absolutely corpulent, but his face, though massive, had preserved something of the sharpness of expression which was so remarkable in that of his brother. By the way, Sherlock, I expected to see you round last week to consult me over the Manor House case. I thought you might be in it laugh at your death. No, I solved it. It was Adam, of course. Yes, it was Adam. I was sort of it from the first. This is Mark. <laughs> now I can see how the art runs in the family. <laughs> uh, by the way, Sherlock, <clears throat> I've been... Um, I've had something quite after your own heart, a most singular problem submitted to my judgment. I really have not the energy to follow it up, save in a very complete fashion, but it gave me the basis for some very pleasing speculations, if uh, you'd care to hear the facts. My dear Michael, I should be delighted. Oh, Mr. Holmes, the police do not credit me. On my word, they do not. Just because they have never heard of it before, they think that such a thing cannot be. But I know that I shall never be easy in my mind until I know what has become of my poor man with the sticking plaster upon his face. The fact is that I have no intention that you should see the place to which we are driving. It might possibly be inconvenient to me if you could find your way here again. No ill will, Mr. Mellis, I hope. But we couldn't get on without you. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it. But if you try any tricks, God help you. Uh, what do you want with me? <laughs> Only to ask a few questions of a Greek gentleman who's visiting us. And to let us have the answers. There is this a very many, and then bosses the sink at the sisu. And we have the gathorn, we have the 
He says that he cares nothing for himself. Damn him. Can't you persuade him, Mr. Mellor? Tell him that as soon as he signs, he can see her. Door opened and a woman stepped into the room. I could not see her clearly enough, but she was tall and graceful, with, I think, black hair, and clad in some sort of loose white gown. She cried out when she saw the prisoner and rushed towards him. She cried his name again and again, Paul, Paul. And the man screamed, Sophie, Sophie! Get her out of here! I'll give her this That will do, Mr. Mallow. That will do. You perceive that we've taken you into our confidence over some very private business. We should not have troubled you. Only our friend who speaks Greek and who began these negotiations has been forced to return to the East. It was quite necessary for us to find someone to take his place. And we were fortunate in hearing of your powers. Ah, uh, I'm glad to be of service. <laughs> there are five sufferings here, which will, I hope, be a sufficient fee. But remember, if you speak to a human soul about this, one human soul, mind, well, may God have mercy on your soul. You, you, you may rely on me, Mr... Uh... Mr. <laughs> Never mind names, Mr. Mellor. Never mind names. Remember this. We shall know if you speak of this. We have our own means of information. I understand. <laughs> good. I think we can rely on your good sense. Now, you'll find the carriage waiting, and my friend will see you on your way. This is where you get out. Where are we? I'm sorry to leave you so far from your house, but there is no alternative. Any attempt upon your part to follow the carriage can only end in injury to yourself. Out you get. Oh, oh thank God. Sir, sir. Yes? Who's there? I can't see you in the shadows. Step out into the light of my lantern. I am sorry. I must have startled you. Can you tell me what place this is? Why, sir, this is Wandsworth Common. Oh, I see. Uh, can I get a train into town? Well, if you walk on a mile or so to Clapham Junction, you'll be just in time for the last train to Victoria. I am most grateful to you. Good night. Good night. So that was the end of my adventure, Mr. Holmes. I do not know where I was, nor whom I spoke with, nor anything, save what I have told you. But I know that there is foul play going on, and I want to help that unhappy man if I can. I told the whole story to Mr. Mycroft Holmes next morning, and subsequently to the police. Mm -hmm. Have you taken any steps, Mycroft? Well, I published this in the Daily News. Mm. Anybody supplying any information as to the whereabouts of a Greek gentleman named Paul Cretides from Athens, who is unable to speak English, will be rewarded. Uh, a similar reward paid to anyone giving information about a Greek lady whose first name is Sophie. This has appeared in all the dailies. There has been no answer. How about the Greek legation? Oh, I've inquired. They know nothing. A wire for the head of the Athens police, then? <laughs> Sherlock has all the energy of the family. Oh. Well, you take up the case by all means and let me know if you do any good. Certainly, I'll let you know. And Mr. Mellas, also. In the meantime, Mr. Mellas, I should certainly be on my guard if I were you, for of course they must know through those advertisements that you have betrayed them. Well, goodbye, Mr. Mellas. Mycroft? Mm -hmm. well, goodbye, Sherlock. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes, mm -hmm. and... Uh, Good luck. You see what? 
Our evening has been by no means wasted. Some of my most interesting cases have come to me in this way through my cross. The problem which we have just been, although but one explanation, has some distinguishing features. You have hopes of solving it? Well, knowing as much as we do, it will be singular indeed if we fail to discover the rest. You must yourself have formed some theory with which to explain the facts to which we've listened. Uh, in a vague way, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your idea, then? Uh, well, it seemed to me to be obvious that this Greek girl had been carried off by the young Englishman named Harold Latimer. Carried off? Yeah. Uh, Athens, perhaps? Uh, no, no. Watson, this young man could talk no word of Greek. The lady could talk English fairly well. Inference that she had been in England some little time, but he had not been in Greece. Hmm. Well, then we will presume that she had come on a visit to England and that this Harold had persuaded her to fly with him. But that is the more probable. Then the brother, for that I fancy must be the relationship, comes over from Greece to interfere. He imprudently puts himself into the power of the young man and his older associate. They seize him and use violence towards him in order to force him to sign some papers to make over the girl's fortune to them. This he refuses to do. In order to negotiate with him, they have to get an interpreter, and they pitch upon Mr. Mellas, having used some other one before. The girl is not told of the arrival of her brother and finds out by the merest accident. Mm. Mm, excellent, Watson. I really fancy that you are not far from the truth. Uh, you see that we hold all the cards, and we have only to fear some sudden violence on their part. If they give us time, we must have them. Uh, shall we cross while we can? Oh. But how can we find where this house lies? Well, if our conjecture is correct and the girl's name is or was Sophie Cratelis, we should have no difficulty in tracing her. That must be our main hope. For the brother, of course, is a complete stranger. It is clear that some time has elapsed since this Harold established relations with the girl. For some weeks, at any rate, since the brother in Greece has had time to hear of it and come across. Mm. If they had been living in the same place during this time, it is probable that we shall have some answer to Mycroft's advertisement. Now, shall we hasten to Baker Street for a pipe and a dish of tea? Oh, ah, yeah. What are you doing here? Come in, Sherlock. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes. You don't expect such energy from me, do you, Sherlock? Mm. But uh, somehow this case attracts me. How did you get here? I passed you in a hansom. There has been some new development. Mm. I had an answer to my advertisement. Ah. Yes. It came within a few minutes of your leaving. And to what effect? Oh, really, it is. Written with a J pen on royal cream paper by a middle-aged man with a weak constitution. Uh, sir, he says, in answer to your advertisement of today's date, I beg to inform you that I know the young lady in the question very well. If you should care to call upon me, I could give you some particulars as to her painful history. She is living at present at the Myrtles, Beckenham, or faithfully, J. Davenport. He writes from Lower Brixton. Do you not think that we might uh, drive to him now, Sherlock, and uh, learn these particulars? My dear Michael, the brother's life is more valuable than the sister's story. I think we should call at Scotland Yard for Inspector Gregson and go straight out to Beckenham. We know that a man is being done to death, and every hour may be vital. Uh, hadn't we better pick up Mr. Mellas on our way? We may need an interpreter. Excellent, Watson. Send the boy for the four-wheeler, and we shall be off at once. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, Watson, you may need your revolver. Mm -hmm. I should say from what we have heard that we are dealing with a particularly dangerous gang. So, now, let us find Mr. Mellas, and then to Beckenham. Could you tell Mr. Malat that Mr. Holmes has come to see him? You just missed him, sir. A gentleman called for him not ten minutes ago. Could you tell us where he is going? I don't know, sir. I only know that he drove away with the gentleman in the carriage. Did the gentleman give you a name? No, sir. He, he wasn't a tall, handsome, dark young man. Oh, no, sir. 
he was a little gentleman with glasses, thin in the face, but very pleasant in his ways, for he was laughing all the time he was talking. Laughing? Come along. This goes serious. These men have got hold of the last again. He is a man of no physical courage, as they are well aware from their experience the other night. This villain was able to terrorize him the instant that he got into his presence. No doubt they want his professional services, but having used him, they may be inclined to punish him for what they will regard as his treachery. Mm. Our hope was that by taking the train, we might get to Beckenham as soon as or sooner than the carriage. On reaching Scotland Yard, however, it was more than an hour before we could get hold of Inspector Gregson and also comply with the legal formalities which would allow us to enter the house. It was a quarter to ten before we reached London Bridge and half past before the four of us alighted on Beckenham platform. Then a drive of half a mile brought us to the Myrtles, a large dark house standing back from the road in its own grounds. Here, we dismissed our cab and made our way up the drive together. The windows are all dark. The house seems deserted. Well, Gregson, it would seem that our birds are flown and the nest empty. Well, why do you say so? The carriage, heavily loaded with luggage, has passed out during the last hour. <laughs> I saw the wheel tracks in the light of the gas lamp. But where does the luggage come in? You may have observed the same wheel tracks going the other way. But the outward-bound ones were very much deeper. So much so that we can say for certain that there was a very considerable weight on the carriage. You get a trifle beyond me there. Right, let's see if anyone is at home after all. Here's the door. Oak panelled. It will not be an easy door to force. Well, let's knock first. Well, that's enough noise to wake the dead. Well, where's Holmes gone? He just slipped away. Ah, here he is. I have a window open for you. It is a mercy that you are on the side of the force and not against it, Mr. Holmes. Right. Where's this window? Just follow me. I think that under the circumstances, we may enter without waiting for an invitation. What is that? What? Listen. It's coming from upstairs. Come on. What? He's in here. <laughs> it's charcoal smoke. <laughs> It'll clear. Uh, Watson, open the landing window. Of course. Uh, we can enter in a minute. <laughs> There's two men in there. We must get them up quickly. Where is Gamble? I doubt if you could strike a match in that atmosphere. Here, I have one. Oh, I'll just light it. Good. Now, we shall dash into the room and pull them out. Ready? Now, uh, my cross. Then will you be holding the light at the door? Yeah. Ready? Yes, yes. Now. <laughs> oh, my God, Holmes, look at their faces. They've been beaten insensible. Now we will need your medical skills. They're near death. <laughs> the fumes of the whole pile. Get them to the window, quickly. <laughs> I fear, gentlemen, we have come too late for the prisoner. Mr. Crotides is dead. We might have saved him. That's the infernal delay at Scotland Yard. Well, Mr. Holmes... I need some brandy for Mr. Mellat. He's still alive, but only just. Well, here you are, sir. Oh. I always carry a flask for the cold nights. There. Uh, drink a little more, Mr. Mellat. 
Uh, oh, thank God. Thank God. Yeah, Mr. Mellis, uh, sit uh, in this chair by the window. Mr. Melas survived his terrible ordeal. When he was well enough, he told us his story. It confirmed our deductions. His visitor, on entering his rooms, had drawn a life preserver from his sleeve and had so impressed him with the fear of instant and inevitable death that he kidnapped him for a second time. Indeed, it was almost mesmeric the effect which this giggling ruffian had produced upon the unfortunate linguist for he could not speak of him, save with trembling hands and a blanched cheek. He was forced to interpret. But this time, the two Englishmen threatened their captive with instant death if he did not comply with their demands. They failed to force Cretides to sign and hurled him into a dark room. They then beat Mr. Malas insensible as revenge for the advertisements. So... This was the singular case of the Greek interpreter. Once the two villains knew their secret was out and that their prisoner was not to be coerced, they fled the house, taking the girl with them, having first, as they thought, taken vengeance both upon the man who had defied and the one who had betrayed them. Months afterwards, a curious newspaper cutting reached us from Budapest. It told how two Englishmen who had been travelling with a woman had met a tragic end. They had each been stabbed, it seems, and the Hungarian police were of the opinion that they had quarrelled and had inflicted mortal wounds upon each other. Holmes, however, is, I fancy, of a different way of thinking, and he holds to this day that if one could find the Grecian girl one might learn how the wrongs of herself and her brother came to be avenged. And that concludes this presentation of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Greek Interpreter, adapted for radio and directed by Richard Shannon. Edward Pepperbridge was Sherlock Holmes with David DePeart as Dr. John H. Watson. Other cast members were Neville Watchurst, John Yannon, George Savides, and Alec Linstead. Music was performed by Robert Gibbs, sound designed by Tim Crook. Support for this program comes from National Public Radio member stations and NPR. Sherlock Holmes will be back in The Hound of the Baskervilles. I'm Steve Zakar. This is NPR, National Public Radio.